Jim is um, in Pennsylvania. We have, I don't know if you know or not, but we have this network we call Link, and um, it's a group of maybe, I don't know, 30 to 40 pastors. They pastor all over um, the United States and Canada, and, and they look to Jim like a spiritual father. And so when they have issues with their board or their elders or... Um, you know, dreams and visions, how to expand their church, how to, how to grow in the things of the Spirit as well as grow a church. They call him, and, and so that's where he's at. He has that powerful message on family revival, right? And so, you know, sometimes we want him all to ourselves, but when God gives him a word like that, how many of you know it's not just for us here at Trinity? It is for the nation. It's for the world. And, and so we bless him and uh, let him go, but then, you know, you're here with me right now today or Tim or somebody like that, so... But um, I don't know if Jim's watching or not. He might be preaching right now. But I bless you, Tim, Jim, and, um, and Tim. I'm nervous. <laughs> I thought after the first service I wouldn't be so nervous. <laughs> so, I don't know, a year and a half ago, Elizabeth Timefook, who's a friend of mine, she um, has a ministry called International Young Prophets, and she gathered up a group of people she called reformers. I had never heard that word or term used before, except for like Martin Luther and, you know, the Reformation, that kind of thing, or uh, the reformers who don't believe in women preachers or something like that. I've heard about those guys. And so like she's gathering up the reformers, and I'm like, okay, she invited me to go. She's like, you're a reformer. And that was the first time anybody had actually said that over me. Becky, you're a reformer. And, and when I went to this group, this gathering, this round table, I met these younger men and women, and they were really making transformation in their cities, in their communities, in Detroit, Michigan, and, and just different places. And um, as I was listening to them, and then they were listening to me, and I got to share my story, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I am a reformer. I'm a reformer. And, and so ever since then, I've been walking around and saying, hey, I'm a reformer. And I'm starting this thing called Reformers Collective. And you want to be a reformer too? So that's kind of what I'm here to say is that, yeah, I'm a reformer. And do you want to be a reformer too? Anybody want to be a reformer? So I want to preach to you or speak to you today a little bit about what a reformer is that we learned from the life of Joseph and just to see how God would speak to you. You know, there's there's always a convergence when I bring a message. There's always something that God is bringing a lot of different things together. And, and Tim and Brandy just joined our church. They moved from California and he was out there in Legacy Park. And he's, yeah, okay, awesome. You got a little cheering fan here. He was in Legacy Park and he saw the four core values. And those things are 16 years old. Like Jim got that download from the Holy Spirit in 2005, you guys marketplace. I mean, you know, the story was, was that Jim's like, I don't know how to lead a church. I don't know what to do. I just need to, you resign and let somebody else lead it. And the Holy Spirit showed up and said, if you will take these four core values and build your ministry, build Trinity Church around these four core values, I will help you. I will be with you. I will grow it. And it was before we were in this sanctuary or anything like that. But you know, substance. How many of you believe that we are experiencing the presence of the Lord now like we've never experienced it in the whole history of Trinity Church? You know, at least since we've been here, all you have to do is, I mean, just today, the presence of the Lord, right? But Monday nights and then Tuesday night prayer, Wednesday night, young, yeah, the youth and uh, just heavy presence, substance. The second one is covenant relationships. And the honest to goodness, that sermon series on family revival is all about covenant covenant relationships where we covenant, covenant to one another and say, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to hang it. We're going to be in this together. We're going to grow together. We're going to do whatever we have to do to bring healing to our families, church-wise and, and natural-wise. So, you know, covenant relationships. Then legacy, come on. There is a group of young people, junior high, high schoolers, young adults who are like on fire for God. Our children, are you kidding me? Our children, never in the history of my 42 years of ministry, mine and Jim, 42 years we've been pastoring. We've never had a staff where we're all on board and believing God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our ch nurseries, in our preschools, in our elementary, in our junior high. Come on, you guys. In our high school, in our young adults, in the grown-ups. Come on, you guys. Let's hear it. Come on. We're going after the presence of God. Our children, our children's ministers are so on fire. They've developed curriculum that's going throughout the nation 
through Brazil. They're starting worship classes in the afternoons. I mean, it's crazy what God's doing. And so never before, so it seems like the right time. We've got the staff who are all in for revival and a moving of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and um, we're believing for the prophet and for the apostle and the pastor, teacher, evangelist to all come together. We're going to see what that, uh, that is. And, and there's a Gideon's army. That's you. Gideon's army. <laughs> Do you know the story about Gideon? Like God called him to be a mighty man of valor and, to, you know, defeat the enemy. And he started with this large army, this large group of people, thousands of men. And God kept windling it down, down, down. Not that they were bad or that they weren't, you know, worthy, but there was just things that had to be cut away. He was just going down, down, down to the core 300 men that God, he wanted all the glory, you know. And, and so you guys have... As Tim said earlier, you've survived. Man, we survived COVID. We survived a presidential election. We survived the, uh, George Floyd and the racial issues that we've had. We've survived changing the audio visual. Come on, you guys are still here, even though, you know, it's so bright and light and you're still here. We even survived the changing of Trinity Christian School. All of those were hard. All of those are one, one transition like that could blow you away, you know, or, or move you out. But no, I'll, I'll, you, we have together survived that. And God has a core of people here that he's wanting to do something incredible with. Incredible. I'm, thank, I'm thankful that you're here. And, and then we were commissioned last week by Bill Ham, And I showed it in the first service. I'm not going to show it in, the, in this service. But um, last week in this service, how many of you were here and you saw that? You saw uh, Bishop Hammond speak over Jim and me and saying that we will be an apostle prophet team for the third reformation and we would um, steward this Joshua generation is what he called it. But today I wanna to call it a Joseph generation and I, cause I wanna talk about Joseph and I believe that he is gathering the Joseph generations in this place today. And I honor you, Larry Sparks from Destiny. Thank you for being here. And he wants it to be here cause he wants to be a part of wherever there's revival, he's going. And, and then he heard about the reformers and he wants to be a part of that. And so let me just give you a definition of what a reformer is, okay? So what is a reformer, Becky? The, uh, de the definition? The Webster de definition, or when I Googled it, it said, this is, this is what it said. It says, a reformer is a person who makes change to something in order to improve it. Is there any reformers here? Somebody who wants to make a change to something. It might be your family. It might be your neighborhood. It might be your city. It might be the government. It might be politics. It might be business. But there is somebody here who sees something that needs change. And you're willing to be that person. Or my definition of a reformer is one who has godly solutions to earthly problems. One who receives godly solutions to earthly problems. There's a lot of people who are burdened, who want to be social justice people. But they're trying to do it without the wisdom of God. And they're not really making any real lasting change. But the men and women of God who get downloads from the Holy Spirit, who has an intimate relationship with God, who hears his voice and who walks in obedience and you get downloads on how. I had two friends here this morning and they couldn't stay. And I'm so sad that they, they weren't able to stay. But Farrell was here and she's a beautiful young woman. And her and her family moved into South Dallas and not... Like, we're South Dallas. No, like real South Dallas, okay? Like a certain zip code right there by uh, Fair, Fair Park and everything. And where Martin Luther King and Malcolm X meet, that's kind of South Dallas. Her and her husband and children moved in there. And, and um, she was raised as a single mom in Oak Cliff. Her father was a very successful businessman who lost it all because of drug addiction and ended up in prison. And, and so she knows what it's like to... Uh, struggle to see a single mom struggle and then they moved to South Dallas and they saw outside their windows the liquor stores and the exchanging of drugs and and the broken families and what that meant and God just gave her this heart to make a transformation in that part of town South Dallas she's got a whole kingdom legacy company built around it and Holy Spirit told her to buy up every empty building that comes available in that zip code area 
And so through her real estate company, God's giving her instruction and education and understanding on how to do it and giving her divine appointments. This, this um, what did she call it? The guy who has, owns a lot of property? Slumlord, yeah. She met this, like the biggest slumlord of South Dallas who owned all these properties. And she would go in with him and see no running water, no electricity, no plumbing, um, homeless men, mental illness, um, people in wheelchairs living in these, you know, broken down buildings and God's given her a vision for it. And now he's giving her favor and giving her instruction on how to bring the change. And it's incredible what God's doing through this young woman. And then I had my friend Alonzo and he's um, bought acres of land in the bottoms over by where the, the zoo is, Dallas Zoo, and building 150 homes right now. So, you know, I mean, just what God's doing through him around the world in real estate. And he's from South Oak Cliff. He graduated from South Oak Cliff High School. And, and so I wanted you to meet them, but they had to leave after the first service. But I'm here to tell you that there are real reformers doing real reform and bringing real reformation into cities. And they're spirit-filled believers, and they're just doing their thing. They're not making a big noise about it. They're just doing the stuff. They're just making the changes because they see broken things, and Holy Spirit's calling to them to those places. And I'm here to tell you that's what God wants to do with you. That's exactly what God wants to do with you. And so we're having a conference. Uh, this is a great opportunity for, for me to plug my first ever Reformers Collective Conference. Come on, October 18th and 19th. It's a Monday and Tuesday, and I want you all to come and support me. You need to be there, and you need to come and support me. It's free, but bring some friends. Bring some people that you know that are in business or in real estate or care about foster children or the broken places of the world. Bring, there are a lot of people who want social justice, and so bring those people. And we're going to introduce them to Holy Spirit and, and tell them how they can really make a change. And so we actually have, uh, you can text the word reformer. Do we have that? Yeah, we, we can text the word reformer. Aren't we cool? We can text reformer and that'll take you to the page to register for that conference. You're going to want to be here and meet Farrell and Alonzo. Let's talk about Joseph the reformer, okay? Solutions to fix broken things. The biggest thing that was broken, the only thing that Joseph knew that was broken at the time was his family. His family was broken. I don't know if you know the story of Joseph, but he is the grandson to Abraham. Abraham was his great-grandfather, and then Abraham Isaac was his grandfather. Abraham Isaac and Jacob. Jacob was his father. And so he was born into that legacy, into that, you know, amazing chosen people of God. You know, that, that Abrahamic blessing and calling that God was bringing out of people to where he could show his goodness to them and, and show how powerful he was and how loving he was and how God, the one and true and only God, could just make a difference in people's lives. And so he was part of that godly heritage of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's his spiritual heritage. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 and 2, it tells us a little bit about where we find uh, Jacob and Joseph at this time. In Genesis 37, 1 and 2, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. So Joseph's a shepherd. And, and he was with his brothers, his brothers from his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. All right, so here we have Joseph. He's, he's a shepherd out with his father's mistress's sons. Okay, there's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? The 12 sons. Joseph was number 11, and he's out there with his brothers, and it says, the young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah and his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to his fathers. This is what I have to say about that. Families are messy. How many of you say amen and amen? Families are messy. I love the story that God just puts it all out there. How many of you would like your family story written in a book that would be read by millions and millions of people throughout all time? 
I mean, all, not the stuff that everybody sees, but the secret stuff, the, sec- the stuff that nobody knows about, right? The stuff that, the conversations that no one hears but you, right? I mean, it's like, whoa, like how horrible would that be? <laughs> and we see Jacob, who is Joseph's dad, he has a story, just like your mom and dad had a story. And his story impacts his son's. Jacob was the youngest of twins born to Isaac and Rebekah, and um, he was a scoundrel. He was a deceiver. He was a surplanter. He stole his brother's birthright and his brother's blessing, and his brother wanted to kill him, literally. And so Jacob runs away to his uncle Laban's house. And, and is gone for years and years and years. And there at his uncle Laban's house, he meets and falls in love with Rachel. But again, I have to tell you that families are messy. <laughs> because Jacob ends up with two wives and two mistresses and 12 sons, okay? But somewhere along the line, as Jacob is coming to the end of himself and realizing he needs some help, he, he finds his way back to God. He doesn't just find his way back to God's promised land. He finds himself back to God. He has a powerful encounter with God that changes everything about him. He has this incredible vision. He wrestles with God. God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, and he becomes the father of the Jewish people, really, Israel. You know, it's incredible. But what happens is what happens sometimes to some of us. Life gets in the way. And hard things happen, and life just has a way of stealing the passion, right? Sometimes we, lo- le- we lose the fervor, we lose the passion, and we lose the zeal that we once had. How many of you have memories of an encounter with Holy Spirit? You know, I have memories, and I like to talk about it when I used to do triathlons. And I used to run. I mean, people still today ask, are you still running? Are you running any marathons? Are you doing triathlons? And, and I have to say, uh, no, that was like seven years ago, eight years ago. But I can tell you about them. Let me talk to you about them. I'll tell you about my training and, and how, what it was like. But see, that's a memory. It's not impacting who I am today. That's just what I used to be, right? And so Jacob has a used to be encounter with the Holy Spirit. And how many of you understand that the purpose of revival is to renew the fires of God, to bring back to life the dead things. And some of us have dead testimonies. We've lost the passion. We've lost the fervor. We've lost the purpose of God for our lives. And we're just kind of going through the motions, even in church and things like that. And that's kind of where Jacob had, where we find Jacob at this Jacob loses his passion for God, and what he loses also is his ability to have spiritual impact on his family. So if no no other reason, that's enough reason to desire and hunger for a new encounter with Holy Spirit so that you can once again have passion, not just for God, but have influence in, in your family. So Jacob's lost his passion, his fervor. His sons are all messed up, but there's one, right? It just takes one. How many of you just say, it just takes one? I'm the one. <laughs> Jacob has 12 sons, but all God needed was one son to say, I'm going to step up. Pick me. Pick me to renew the fire of God in my generation, in my heritage, in my legacy. So Joseph is son number 11. He's the firstborn to Jacob's true love, Rachel. He's the love child. And that kind of says something to us because his brothers are not from a love relationship. It's more out of duty. And they represent, in my mind, the 11 brothers represent people who might have a relationship with God and the fact that they do the duty thing. They come to church. They sit in church. They sing the worship songs. But they don't have the fire. They don't have the passion. They don't meet with him secretly and hear his voice one-on-one and have relationship with him. And yet we see Joseph, he's, he's made of something different. He is marked. Say marked. Joseph was marked for a different story. He's marked to have purpose, to continue the God people, the God, God's chosen people. 
You know, as a teenager, um, I had this encounter with Holy Spirit when I was in seventh grade. I've shared that so many times with you guys. It was such a marked time in my life, so much so that I was willing to lay everything down for Jesus. And I started a bus ministry, and it really took all my Saturdays from junior high and high school. People say, were you, were you in sports? No. You know, did you do this at school? No. Uh, what did you do? I had a bus ministry. My whole junior high and high school, that's what I could tell you. I had a bus ministry. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I didn't have a whole lot of social activity or social life. I had a bus ministry. And so we would go every Saturday. Um, somebody, I'd get somebody to drive me down to the projects in Cleveland, and i go knocking on the doors, door to door, on the projects in Cleveland. And i say, hey, we have a bus ministry, and we would like to take your kids for, you know, three hours. How about that? Would you be okay with us if we came and picked your kids up, and we'd take them to Sunday school, and then we'll bring them back home, and we'll feed them breakfast? And they all said yes, of course, you know. And so we built this bus ministry. And, and the, the, the thing that I remember most about that was, not so much that I just wanted them to come to church to learn about Jesus, but on my way home, after we would take them back and I would walk home on those Sundays, I would literally be weeping and heaving in, in, in just compassion for their life situation. I wanted them to have homes. I wanted them to have jobs. I wanted their families to be healed. And so even at that moment, do you understand that I was marked as a reformer because I had such compassion for the broken lives of these people. And so then you kind of, you know, uh, go forward from that to where we're at now. But this, this is something that I had forgotten about that I was reminded as I was studying this. Um, when I was about ninth grade, 10th grade, Um, We had a pretty good youth group at our church in Parma, Ohio. There was probably maybe 50 or 60 kids in that youth group and maybe 100 on some good nights, you know, special nights and events. But there was a moment when our youth leader decided that he didn't want to live for Jesus any longer, that he was tired of faking it. He was tired of playing the church game and he was no longer going to serve God and live for God. And and he was walking away from the church and walking away from God. And when he did that, about three-fourths of our youth group went with him, including my sister and the pastor's son, Eddie, who she ended up marrying. She, she moved in with him and lived with him. And, and for about the next four years, up to 10 years, from four to 10 years, these young people got into drugs and living together and, and you know, sex, and they just went crazy wild because they were just tired of playing church and they didn't see the power they didn't see the love they didn't see what we promised it was it wasn't happening and so they got disillusioned and they walked away and so here I am left with about 10 other kids all the weird ones (laughs) so it's Becky and her 10 as a ninth grader And those years of high school was the loneliest years of my life because church had been everything to me. I didn't have participation in school. I wasn't cool. I wasn't, you know, anything like that. And and the church was everything. But here, all of these people had walked away from God. and, And so for the next four years, it became a very lonely time for me. And, um... Yeah, during those years, God marked me. God, God marked my life. And I wouldn't want that for anybody. I'm not saying that that has to happen. But I have to tell you, there are times in your life when God strips everything away from you. And that's what happened with, with Joseph. Joseph. You know, he was trying to stand when no one else around him was standing, right? And that brings us to some lessons that we need to learn from him. It says in Genesis 37, uh, verses 3 and 4, Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than his other sons, because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age. And he made a robe of many colors for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Can I tell you something about favor? Favor is not fair. And God does not care. I'm telling you, there is an opportunity for you to live in the favor of God. 
It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what you've done, what you've been through. It doesn't matter. I'm just telling you here today, if for no other reason, I'm here to tell you that God's favor is looking for you. God is looking for someone to show his favor on. And you might say somebody else is more qualified, somebody else. Joseph had 11 brothers older than him that should have been in line for the favor, but God saw Joseph because Joseph was willing to take a stand for God and say, I'm different. I'm not going to bow down. But the other thing about favor is not only is it not fair, but it has a purpose to it. Favor is for a purpose. God's love and his favor on our life is for us to do something great for him. And at that moment, at that time in my life, my purpose was bus ministry. So the purpose for you at this time might be just to be faithful to serve hospitality or to go and be a a mom for foster kids or maybe to go with J. Dan into the prisons. I mean, there are so many places for us to go. For me here was for me to go into Cedar Hill High School for 15 years to do a Bible study that no one came to. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? But there is an open door. There's a place for God to use you. And God used that favor on my life to bring so many opportunities. And now in the WNBA as a chaplain there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? It's not doing something big and great and grand. It's just being faithful to where God sends you, to where there's one hurting person. There's one person who needs. So it's for a purpose. Favor, revival, this is what what I wrote down. Revival rekindles intimacy and fervor for God. Reformers come out of that intimacy and fire to go into the world to be light and salt and who say and do this, your kingdom come, your will be done here in this place, even as it is in heaven. All right, let me, let's just go real quickly here through the process of a reformer, the process of a reformer from the life of Joseph. Number one, the first thing is we see the intimacy. We've already talked about that, but the heart of a reformer operates from the foundation of love. The heart of a reformer operates from intimacy with God. To be a reformer, you have to know the voice of God. To be a reformer, you have to hear, I mean, like not big, profound things, but if you had met Farrell and Alonzo, who was here at first service, what God told me was to go to a place called Bonton Farms. Have any of you heard of that? It's in Dallas. It's this little hole in the wall. And this man named Darren from Frisco heard God say, I want you to go to the poorest of the poor place in Dallas, which was Bonton. And I want you to do a Bible study. And he was obedient to the Lord to do that. And he went to Bonton and he had these men and they couldn't get jobs. They were coming out of prison. They had no jobs or employment. They were very sickly. And he realized that they were so sick because there was no fresh fruits or vegetables for them to eat. All that there was were little corner stores. It's called food deserts. Have you heard of that? Food deserts. It would take them over an hour on the bus to go to a grocery store where there was actually fruits and vegetables. And so none of these families had fruits and vegetables. So he began to plant some, some vegetables. Here's this man from Frisco, comes to Bonton, and he plants a garden. There's no running water, so they have to go into the, the houses, some house there, and they have to fill up these baby pools, and they carry the water to, to these plants. Anyway, six years later, you guys, there's acres of the most beautiful organic garden you've ever seen in your life in Bonton. There's a restaurant there. There's a coffee shop there. Uh, homes for, for Habitat for Humanity have come in and built hundreds of homes around that place. And it's the most amazing thing. And it's right here. Why have we not heard about it? Why have we not been there? So one day, Cindy Jacobs like, I want to go to Bonton Farms. You want to go with me? And I'm like, yes, I've been wanting to go. And so we go. And when we go, we meet these incredible people that are there. Do you understand? You just go. You just go. Go to the grocery store. You go to the school. You go to the hospital. You go to the ICU waiting room. You can go anywhere. There's so many places to go, right? I went to Bonton Farms and I met these incredible people who are literally changing South Dallas. So that's what God does. But it comes through intimacy. It comes through learning to hear God's voice and being obedient to go. So it's not anything big profound. It's just being obedient to go. 
I love this scripture in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 35 through 38. It says, uh, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. That's pretty amazing, right? I mean, that's what Jesus is supposed to do. He teaches, he preaches, he heals, he raises people from the dead, he casts out demons, right? But then verse, verse 36, listen to this. But when he saw the multitudes... He was, say it with me, moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I don't know, does that impact you like it did me? (laughs) I mean, Jesus was doing all the Jesus stuff. He was preaching and teaching and healing and raising people from the dead and casting out demons. He says, but then he saw broken people. He saw broken things. And the Bible says that he was moved with compassion. Intimacy with Jesus moves us to have compassion. And literally, Jesus' whole strategy of ministry changed. He's like, oh man, the harvest is so big. There's so many broken things. There's so many broken people. Pray, pray for laborers. Pray for reformers. Pray that there will be men and women who will rise up and see and be moved with compassion into the broken places of the world. That's his plan. And it hasn't changed. He sent them out two by two into the, into the neighborhoods, into the world. Ah, it's through intimacy. It's through intimacy with Jesus that we're moved with compassion. The second thing is, not only is it about intimacy, but the second thing is about the coat. We need a coat. Reformers carry authority that disperses the enemy and darkness from every sphere of influence. Reformers carry authority. They carry power. They carry the ability to bring change into broken places. The coat, the coat was the coat of many colors, right? And there's seven colors in the rainbow. You all know Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Seven colors on this mantle, on this coat. It just made me, as I was setting it, made me think of What Isaiah chapter 11 says about the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are what we need to bring solutions, to bring godly solutions to earth's problems. We need the spirit of the living God. That's why Jesus said... I have to go away because if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit and I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, not just so you can speak in tongues, but that you can get downloads of wisdom and instruction and power and might. I believe that this coat represents the mantle of the Holy Spirit. The definition for mantle is an important role or responsibility that passes from one person to another. That's what I do when I feel the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Me and Laura, whoa. (laughs) I have been filled with the Holy Spirit since I was a little girl and I never understood it had purpose. It has a purpose. It's to compel you into the world with power and wisdom and might to change the broken places and the broken things. So yes, be filled with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) It's a mantle. The code is the Holy Spirit. I love this verse uh, in Luke 24, verse 39. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with 
power from on high. But listen to this version that I have. I am going to send you what my Father has promised you. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power. You stay. You stay in your secret place. You stay in that place of God's presence until you are clothed with power. And then you will see your schools transformed. And then you will see businesses transformed. And then you will see God show up in his power and his might and the ecclesia in the places of our society. And so we need the intimate love, right? And we need the coat of the Holy Spirit. And the third thing is the dreams. I love these dreams, you guys. And God's given me such fresh revelation about them. In Genesis 37, beginning uh, 5 through 7, it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even the more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. Hey, there were... There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And the brothers hated him all the more. And, but as I was looking at that dream, I'm like, Jesus, what, what, are, what are you really saying? What does this dream really mean? I mean, yeah, we know that the brothers are going to come and they'll bow down to Joseph when they come for the food and everything. But this is what I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me about this dream. Joseph knew that he had to stand up. Joseph knew that there was, he was marked by God and that in the midst of everyone bowing down, he had to stand up. I'm telling you, reformers stand up when everybody else bows down. Is there a Joseph generation now of young men and women, of older men and women who will stand up when everybody else is bowing down? And so we see Joseph, he's standing up and everybody else is bowing down. God's calling us to stand up, stand straight. The brothers, they lacked vision, they lacked purpose, they bowed. But Joseph, he's so confident. Come on, he's so arrogant and confident in his calling that he's like, no, I'm not going to bow down. There's a calling of God. I'm marked, and I'm not going to play small. I'm not going to play my life small. I'm going to be all that God has created me to be. Romans 8, 19 says that for the creation eagerly waits for anticipation for God's sons to be revealed or for God's sons to stand up. Is there anybody in this place who says, I feel the power of God. I feel the presence of God. I want to stand at this time and in this place and bring change to the broken places of the world. The second dream is so, is even better. I love it. In Genesis 37, 9, it says, "Ah, look, I have dreamed another dream. Like it wasn't enough that he His brothers hated him all the more. Joseph has gone so far past caring what his brothers think or even what his father thinks. He's gone so far past it. He's like on a whole nother level, you guys. And he says, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars (laughs) bowed down to me. And this time Jacob, the dad, says, what are you saying, boy? What are you saying? You're saying that me and your mother and your brothers are all going to bow down to you? But this is what I, as I was looking at this, this is what I, came to me. You know, at first we think just the same thing that Jacob, that, you know, it's just they're going to bow down to him. But when I looked at it again, I'm I'm thinking it means more. It means that um, the dream is really an indictment on the family. Their lack of vision and their destiny. Listen to this. They, just like you, were made to shine. The sun, the moon the stars. What's their purpose? To shine, to bring light to the darkness. God created them to shine and bring light to the darkness, and they weren't doing that. And they were bowing down, and Joseph is just like, I was made to shine. I'm made to bring forth light. So Joseph's life was convicting, right? It was convicting to everyone around him, and it was also inspiring. Joseph reformers will bring light to dark places. 
They will literally go into the darkest of the darkest places in society and they will let their light shine and bring transformation to those places. That's what our true reformer does. And so we see the dreams. You have a, do you have a dream? Do you have a dream over your life? You need to dream over your life. And in your dream, you need to be the one standing up. You need to be the one shining the light to go into the darkest places. I love this. Isaiah 60, verse 1. This needs to be our theme verse, okay? Arise. Stand up. Shine in the dark places, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen (laughs) upon you. Oh my gosh, do you understand when we're singing and worship and we're talking about the glory? Open up the windows, let the light in. Come on, that's a reformer song. Open up the windows, God. Light, let your light in. I want to shine for you. I want to shine in the dark places. That's what you were created to do. That's what your purpose is, right? And so what do we have to have? We have to have intimacy where we hear the voice of the Lord and we have compassion on the broken things. We have to have a coat. We have to be full of the Holy Spirit, the coat of the Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom and the revelation and the instruction. And we have to have dreams over our life. We have to stand up and we have to shine and we don't play small with your life anymore. Come on. I... I mean, I was talking to my brother this past week, and he's retired on a beach in Sarasota, and I was thinking, I don't want to do a conference. I don't want to do hard things. I don't want to have to figure out a website and and do all this. I want to go to the beach in Sarasota. (laughs) I mean, that's what my flesh wants to do. But there's this young girl who stood for Jesus during her 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. This is my time. This is my time to shine and to stand. Is there anybody else? Anybody else who'll say, Becky, this is my time. Come on, stand up. Let's just give the Lord praise. This is my time. Use us. Oh, God, if you can use anything, God. As soon as Joseph declared his dreams, as soon as 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 he used his voice and said his dreams, he set into motion something that nobody could stop. No enemy of darkness, no human being, nobody could stop what God started the moment that Joseph declared that he would be a reformer, that he would stand up when everybody else was bowing down. And the impact, the fourth thing, what was the impact? The impact was that his brothers, all 11 of his brothers came into their full destiny. At the very end, after he was sold into slavery, after he became a servant in Potiphar's house and ended up in prison, and he became the man, God exalted him to the second place of the known civilization. God used his reforming to bring healing to his family. All 11 of his brothers became all that God created them to be. We talk about the tribe of Judah. His brother Judah was a scoundrel. He was a mess, but God restored to him his calling for praise and worship. And on and on and on. And the other thing it says, it says that when they told Jacob all that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to transform, transport him, it says, listen to this. The spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. Earlier, I said that revival brings out reformers. But maybe, maybe reformers give birth to revival. Oh! 
We're waiting for this awesome move of God and we're waiting for something to happen that we don't even know what to do to go and do something. But maybe if we went and did something and brought some healing and some miracle power, then that would usher in the revival of the Lord. Let's not get it twisted, people. We're called and anointed and empowered to change the world. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord and then come back. And I want to commission you to be a reformer.